Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Chantal Autre. I am the Communications Officer at the Partnership for Economic Policy. And I would like to briefly share some housekeeping points before we begin. We invite you to ask questions to our panelists at any time during this event. Please use the Ask a Question space on the right of your screen to submit your questions. The panelists will answer these questions after the main discussion. You're free to use the general chat box to communicate to all participants, but please note we may miss some questions if they're not submitted via the Ask a Question function. Please keep in mind, this is a public session. Please be courteous and remain on topic. If you have any te technical difficulties, you can click on the question mark on the bottom left of your screen to contact tech support. Please be aware that we are recording this event and we'll share it on our YouTube channel and website. I now hand over to our moderators for today. Renald Berger is a professor at the Economics Department at Stellenbosch University. Fikar Ahmed is the Joint Executive Dire Director at Sustainable Development Policy Institute. Renal and Vicar are both PEP research fellows, and they were both a part of the group of research fellows that conducted a series of studies on the underrepresentation of researchers from the global south in development economics, on which the series is based. Renal and Vicar, I hand over to you. Thanks a lot, Chanda. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. I'll proceed to give a little bit of background on uh, where these conversations started. Uh, firstly, um, I think it helps to just think a little bit about why we care about regional representation at conferences. Why do we think that regional conference or conferences matter for development? And what are the ways in which conferences matter for development? I think the first thing is that um, Easier or more frequent access to conferences can constitute an important advantage to a researcher and plausibly influence their career trajectory. This happens through a number of different mechanisms that provide researchers with opportunities for building networks and for establishing, uh, for establishing new collaborations. Um, they give us the opportunity to promote our new work and to build our brand. They also give those who attend our opportunity to receive expert um, peer feedback on early findings, which can improve research. And then um, also we learn about new developments in methods and theory. What's also important about conferences is conferences help to shape ideas and priorities about development policy. It's a very interactive and formative dialogue uh, platform with a very strong normative role. We assess new findings and ideas, we decide how to frame new work, and we set research priorities. More generally, um, conferences require decisions about who is part of the conversation about development research and policy debates and who is not. And in these decisions, it's vital um, that we think through diversity and fair representation, both as a means to an end, because it enables critical engagement from researchers who often may have a deeper knowledge of the social and political context, uh, people from the from poor countries, uh, developing countries, but also inherently because it's the right thing and those who are most directly affected by these policies have an additional and stronger claim to be part of such conversations, one can argue. Um, and related to that, I think what's also interesting about this dialogue regarding um, regional representation in conferences is the strong geographical location and access component. Um, development conferences are interesting to consider because um, they, up to the COVID crisis, the pandemic, conferences have always required that um, researchers gather in one venue. And the choices about where those venues are matter um, and may introduce uh, symmetries in the time and financial cost of conference attendance, which may be further accentuated by the asymmetries that already exist in visa requirements for travel. Um, we conducted some research, which I'll show you in graphs. Um, just want to quickly show you we <laughs> the little bit of work that we've done already, and there's a working paper on the PIP um, website um, co-authored by Vakar and myself that you can access if you want to know more about the methodology. I won't get stuck in that now. <laughs> As always, there are assumptions that, uh, you know, one can um, 
think through and that might be um, uh, contentious. In this case, the assumption is that we look at the affiliation of the researchers who attended the conferences and use that um, as our categorized basis for uh, as the basis for geographical location. We look at a couple of different um, conferences here. We look at the World Bank's annual um, conference on development economics, the African Bank's um, African Economic Conference, the Center for the Study of African Economies, African um, Development Conference, the Bureau, Bureau for Research and Economic Analysis of uh, in all, <laughs> the Bureau for Research and Economic Analysis of Development Conference, BREAD, and then also the Northeastern Universities Development Consortium Conference. Um, and what we find is what you see here, that six out of 10 presenters at these um, most prestigious development conferences are from developed country universities, and only one out of 10 um, were from developing country universities. The remainder were usually not from universities, but from think tanks and multilateral organizations. Uh, less than 10% of these were affiliated with developing country institutions. And what you also see over time is that these patterns haven't changed much. Um, what we wanted to do, uh, given COVID, is to see if these patterns have changed recently. Um, part of the reason why we wanted to look at whether these patterns um, changed is because um, one of the interesting aspects of access to uh, conferences and regional representation at conferences is whether it's really the geographical location of the conference that drives a lot um, of the representation. And what's interesting here, uh, we just compared 2019 and 2021 because those are the years that are the most representative um, of before and after. We have additional data, but it's patchy. Um, and overwhelmingly, not large shifts are observed apart from bread, which is a big exception. Um, and I think they have really changed the format of the engagement and of the conferences during the COVID era. What I do, what I ever want to note, despite the overall picture that is presented here, is that the selective view concentrating on 2019 and 2021 uh, while that is useful, it also misses some important shifts in 2020 and prior to 2019. So I'll just make a few remarks in that regard. Firstly, um, the Bread Conference started out from a very low base of uh, close to zero. In 2018, they like close to zero um, representation, both of developing country speakers and African speakers. Um, and I think it's also interesting to note that in the uh, in the recent years, the Bread um, participation fell um, again. And then I think the other thing that I should note, which would make Stefan happy, is that CSIE has really um, risen in the last year. Um, its share of developing country speakers rose to 23% and its share of African country speakers rose to 19%. So that is just as an introduction. Um, we are very fortunate to have um, speakers here today, panelists, who are far more knowledgeable than we are, um, and who will be able to guide this debate and um, help us um, engage with, with um, the intricacies around development conferences and representation in far more depth. Um, firstly, we have um, Dr. Kingsley Amuaka, uh, who is the president of the African Economic Center for Transformation. He founded the center in 2008 in Accra, Ghana, to help governments identify the right policy and institutional reforms for sus sustained growth, inclusive development, and lasting poverty reduction. Dr. Amuaka spent two 2006 um, as the Distinguished African Scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center uh, for Scholars. Before this, he was Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa from 2004. Uh, from uh, 1995 to 2005. He started his career working for the World Bank, where he served as the World Bank's uh, division chief for country programs um, in the African region, and also the division chief for sector programs in Latin America and the Caribbean re region. Um, and we invited um, Dr. Amuaka here because he's played such a 
absolutely pivotal role over the years in ensuring that African scholars and policymakers are at the tables where decisions are being made, and also specifically for his role in shaping the African Economic Conference, which is jointly organized by the African Development Bank, the Economic Commission for Africa, and the United Nations Development Program. Um, Stefan Darkon is the professor of economic policy at the Blavatnik um, School of Government and the Economics Department, and also a fellow of Jesus College. He is uh, furthermore, also the director of the Center of, for the Study of African Economies. Uh, Stefan works as a policy advisor, providing strategic economic and development advice and promoting the use of evidence and decision making. Between 2011 and 2017, he was the chief economist of the Department of International Development, DFIT. Um, and between 2020 and 22, he was the um, development policy advisor to successive foreign secretaries at UK at the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Office. He's also a fellow of Breed, a research fellow of CEPR and of ISA, and an affiliate of JPL. Um, and lastly, a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington. Um, we invited Stefan to participate in the panel because of his extensive experience in um, international development and also because as director of the Center for African Economies, he plays a significant role in shaping the dialogues about African development policies. Uh, then um, we have um, Rohini Panda, um, and she is the Henry J. Hines, um, the second professor of economics and also the director of the Economic Growth Center at Yale University. In 2018, um, Professor Pande received the Carol Bell Shaw Award from the Economic, American Economic Association because of her success in promoting um, women in the economics profession. She's a co-chair of the Political Economy and Government Group at, at, uh, at JPL, a board member of the Bureau of uh, Research on Economic Development, and a former co-editor of uh, the Review of Economics and Statistics. Before coming to Yale, um, Prof. Pandey was the Rafik Hariri Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard Kennedy School, uh, where she co-founded Evidence for Policy Design. Um, we, relevant, particularly relevant to the discussion here today, uh, Rohini has been a voice for social justice and also one of the organizers of the North uh, Eastern Universities Development Consortium Conference, which was hosted by Yale this year and as I understand, um, concluded yesterday. So uh, Rohini, I assume that you might still be quite tired <laughs> after this whirlwind activity. Um, and um, just a vote of thanks to all three of you for availing yourself for this conversation. Um, I will now ask a series of questions um, to the panelists and ask them to please um, keep their response to, to five minutes each. Um, the questions that I will ask is what are the main obstacles that explain the low participation of Southern researchers in these leading um, economic development conferences? Um, but tied to that also, what are the main limitations of the papers submitted um, that might explain the poor acceptance rates? And what do you think are the main advantages of Southern authored papers that you feel we would gain if we could um, succeed in getting better representation at development conferences? Over to you. And I think um, I am suggesting that we start with Prof, Prof uh, Amuaku. Thank you. Um, Prof, are, are you on mute? <laughs> uh, thanks very much. I, I've never been a professor, so you can just call me KY. I'm what called KY by my initials, as <clears throat> most people and all my friends call me. And I wanted to thank you very much for asking me to be part of this uh, very important discussion. And in your introduction, you laid out clearly why this conversation is needed now. So thank you, and I'm glad to see that I'm among three uh, very outstanding panelists uh, who have a lot of experience, in many cases, even in some areas more than I do. So collectively, I hope we can, we can, we can, we can talk about this. Yeah, the issue fundamentally that you're asking is why are there not enough 
policymakers or institutions or researchers from the South. Here, I'm going to focus a lot on Africa because my experience, as you know, has been in Africa for the last oh, how many years? I hate even to say it. Uh, uh, and during that time, in terms of economic policy institutes, there's been a number of a good uh, expansion or growth and number of African policy institutes, civil society organizations, starting from the mid 1995 or 90s, when the governance and increased participation of civil society became a key uh, focus of African development. It's also true that Africa has produced and is still producing many outstanding researchers from both policy institutes and academic institutions. Therefore, the question is why are we not getting enough research at these conferences? And also in terms of the quality of the uh, presentations uh, that you also mentioned as an issue, that I'll leave my fellow panelists to talk more about why uh, that is the case. But my take in answering this question is that given all the, the number of institutions in Africa in particular have grown tremendously over the last 20 years or 15 years or so, the capacity of these institutions in general is poor. And they, are, they and their researchers are not fully equipped sometimes to undertake world-class research and analysis and provide policy advice that involve decision. As I've said, we have some outstanding ones who contribute, but overall, from my own experience, working with researchers, appearing in policy institutions, campus across the continent, that's the challenge we see all the time. Uh, and this lack of capacity is due largely to limited funding. And as you all agree, global experience shows that policy institutes, even in the advanced countries, are not self-sufficient, with most depending on grants and donors. African economic policies struggle for financial sustainability, most competing for the same limited donor funding. If I give you an example, there's a recent report on the state of global giving by US Foundation that shows that of the $8 billion given between 2016 and 2019, 61% went to organizations based in the US. Therefore, why is the demand for research by out? Oh, okay, the other point is that is demand for research by Africa government is also limited. Why? Because capacity is limited, governments often do not rely on national or regional policy institutes, but rather call upon international organization or consulting firms. This creates a cycle where by government do not create demand for research, economic policy institutes respond to demand from donors, where the outputs may be more valuable for donor agencies rather than national policymakers. And hence, government do not always see the value addition of local institutes. And in general, there's limited collaboration between and networks among global South researchers and insufficient peer-to-peer -peer learning in particular among African institutes. As a consequence, and it's an important point, global discussions on issues affecting Africa on, on global discussions affecting issues of Africa, the agenda is largely driven by Northern policy institutes, think tanks, foundations, and bilateral and multilateral institutions with little or no input from African policy institutions or researchers, expect, except when they are called upon by these Northern players in their supporting cash rule for data collection or other input. And the result is that Africa's voice tends to be missing in these global debates, or do they have outside impact on African economics and society? This has been very clear from the recent discussions on the global financial architecture and comparison debt, SDR allocation, and the role of gratuitous institutions, among other issues. So that's overall my take. And we at the African Center for Economic and Transformation have been working very hard 
with institutions in Africa, others and partners among the foundations to reverse this and make African institutions more central and build the capacity. And as I'll mention later, the World Bank in particular is coming up with a major initiative that will help us address these capacity constraints uh, that African institutions do. So it's a capacity issue, stupid, if I may say so. And how do we address that? And as I say, African governments are not funding their, their think tanks. We've also tried to see how some African foundations or philanthropy organizations can support African institutions. And it's not easy, it's not happening. And there are so many of these institutions that are trying to help. How do we strengthen them and make sure that we can get a few outstanding ones that can come in and help drive this agenda? So we are very passionate about it. So that's the core to me of the, of the challenge we face. So I will not comment on why the, uh, the papers they present are not good and what type of handholding, if I may put that way, that they can be given. At the core is this issue. So let me stop right here. Okay. Thanks a lot, Professor. Oh, Doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Rohini, are you, can you go next, Prof Pande? Okay, no, thank you very much for um, inviting me to um, talk on this topic. And I should start by saying that I actually don't work on issues in Africa. So my perspective is going to be more from what I've seen at conferences we've coordinated and organized in the US and also some of my experiences uh, working with and in South Asia, especially in India with researchers. So I wanted to go sort of in, in some sense through uh, Ronel's questions uh, as she played them out. So I think the first question she'd asked about, you know, what I may see as the obstacles uh, for Southern researchers to participate in leading international conferences. So I think the data that was presented was really interesting. The one thing I would have loved to see, and I think hopefully for NUDC this year, we'll be able to produce it, is acceptance rates. So while I uh, see that participation rates are low, um, my own sense, at least from looking at NUDC, it's also building on a low base of uh, submissions. Um, now, obviously, the first uh, reason for low rates of submissions would be just you don't hear about the conference. So, um, you know, I think ways of uh, ensuring that people hear about conferences is, is important. I think there's now with a lot of activity in social media that helps, but perhaps, uh, you know, thinking about starting particularly a list um, for PEP or something like that, to start a list where they actually put out and remind people about uh, submission deadlines and what the conference is about could be useful. Um, I come later, I come in a minute to getting accepted, but certainly I think one thing we saw at NUDC among those who we had accepted from, um, you know, African and Asian countries. And this is, I think for the US right now, particularly a post COVID phenomenon, getting visas is very hard. So, you know, uh, one of our one of our invitees from Ghana, you know, applied as soon as he, we, we were able, we were, we informed him in um, the end of September, start of October, but the first date he got was for some time in January or March in the, in the visa center. So, Again, I think um, that that is an ongoing issue in addition to uh, funding needs. And one response that I think is worth thinking about is, um, you know, is it going to be easier to almost create these networks and conferences based in African countries to get around these issues rather than having, you know, the issue, the question of how do we get, um, you know, southern researchers to conferences in the global north. So, uh, I think there were a couple of examples talked about, but certainly, you know, I think it would be good to encourage organizations like the World Bank to think about having development economic conferences, you know, rotate and not just be in DC, but also be in other locations. And certainly, I think both the visa and funding constraints are are slightly less binding on um, 
researchers uh, in the US or Europe. Um, another, another organization I think has started trying to increase its presence in conferences, but tends to have a very broad mandate, not just development as the econometric society. So that the African Econometric Society has annual conferences in a setting in Africa. But again, I think, um, you know, those are not focused on development, but again, working with regional uh, committee members in the econometric society to identify ways to, you know, either expand their focus on development or have, you know, complementary conferences just around the same time. I think one thing I see that seems to work in India, for instance, is that the second or third week in December is when a number of conferences coordinate. So you see uh, both the Econometric Society winter meetings, uh, which are, I think, in early January in Bombay, but they're preceded by two or three conferences in Delhi in December, which I think helps them maybe bring a, a set of um, kind of richer country researchers in, and, and that I think also helps create those networks. Um, in terms of, I think, what are the main advantages of Southern uh, based researchers that could be leveraged better, and I think this is something for us to think about as you organize conferences here, is, is my sense is if you had topic-based sessions, I think those um, those would be ones where uh, you know again topic based sessions asking about how certain issues have been addressed in different contexts. You know that would really build on a strength that um, we lose out in conferences when we don't have researchers from developing countries, which is both identifying you know having a pulse on what is happening on the ground, what are the policy issues that matter, uh, who is addressing them. Right now, very often development conferences are very broad, right? It's like uh, we will take papers in everything in, on every issue and just look to see what rises to the top. So I think one thing that we should perhaps think a little bit more as, when we organize these conferences is whether some tracks are going to help improve um, the ability of Southern Research Supply and also acceptance rates. Uh, since you can have a broader set of criteria rather than just asking, you know, which are the papers that are going to get into the top five or top 10 uh, journals at the end of it, but rather focus on, you know, who's asking the important questions uh, for either specific countries or in specific areas. Um, I think those are some of my thoughts in terms of what um, institutions at PEP can do in terms of things like mentoring submissions. I think I'm slightly less certain that has um, high returns. I think mentoring papers to get them to the state of uh, being accepted in journals is probably the same process as getting them uh, accepted to conferences. So I would focus in some ways on what the, I think the big return for a researcher is, which is getting a paper published. Along the way of doing that, I think that would automatically also improve uh, submissions for conferences. But I think. I would say that let me just conclude by saying that I think the two main things I would highlight is one is thinking about how having stronger networks in sort of home countries where you actually try to um, bring northern researchers who have more resources to come to would be one option. And the other is to try to think hard about and then kind of, I think, uh, lobbying organizers on particular tracks or topic areas that if they announce especially areas of interest in those conferences may attract more uh, speakers. And finally, the last thing I say, I think certainly, you know, Zoom and the virtual world has increased uh, hugely uh, the opportunities available. I think there have been many more of these virtual seminars going on. And I think the one question that raises is where do those virtual conference organizers get to know about work, work that's happening? Because those are often not open submission. You know, they're often inviting. So again, I think encouraging a lot of our kind of uh, seminar series like the VDEV and others to advertise and look to get in more paper submission and those are just virtual seminar series. I think that's a first step again for getting feedback that would help in uh, then submitting to conferences. So let me stop here. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Professor. That's very useful and insightful. Um, before handing over to Stefan, I just want to add two things um, which might have created confusion in my presentation. The first is that I have, of course, not yet, we haven't yet analyzed the data from the conference that um, Prof Pandey just 
uh, finished um, uh, organizing. And then I think the second thing in terms of uh, Dr. Amuako, um, when we looked at the economic, uh, African Economic Conference, of course, because it's based uh, on the continent, the representation is of sort of local African researchers. Um, often it was around 70%, which I think um, uh, nicely dovetails with the point that uh, Prof. Pandey was making. But over to you, Stefan. I'm interested to hear what you have to say on this topic. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for being willing to participate and share your ideas. Well, well that, thank you so much. Um, look, let me try to say a little bit about, you know, the way we look at our conference and what we learn and what we're trying to improve around the question that, uh, that is, a, you know, an important question and, and, and definitely something we, we keep on debating amongst the, each other. So, you know, the, the Center for the Study of African Economies Conference is maybe a bit different from many of the others in that um, we've always tried to be a relatively broad access and rather large conference. Maybe NUDC has an element of that, although we've been doing it for much longer already since the 1990s, in fact. And so the idea has always been to have a relatively broad access conference largely, um, you know, trying to, it's, it's, it's entirely research conference, there's a very little limited amount of a few policy sessions with, um, with the kind of a, all the papers with a minimal level of quality that we try to accept. So in practice, it means, so just before COVID, we ended up with, you know, I, I think it was well over 800 applications and one year before, I think we had over a thousand. Um, but then we could have, something in the order of about 70 sessions over two days, parallel sessions, of course. Now, um, you know, these numbers that uh, were quoted earlier, where in practice we get maybe about 13, 14% participation, well, in 2022, we could get it higher to about a fifth uh, of it. Uh, tell us also a little bit of what some of the, of the challenges we have, because by, we went out of our way in 20, you know, 2021 was a strange one because we, you know, kept on dithering whether we do it. So it was a much, much smaller event. But 2022, we tried very hard to get uh, the larger participation from Africa. And it touches on some of the issues that we have. Um, so we could have more people in person there. In fact, we accept more papers. But actually, for us, the constraint becomes um that we you know it's quite expensive to get them to come over and i think Rony already alluded to it um visas we are having we have actually we allocate more money to try to get african scholars to come over and we succeed often in getting less to come because a uh, visa visa issues in the uk has become an, an increasingly difficult problem so this year we have 30 funded places we know the world bank will fund a couple of other some other places i don't know the numbers some other foundations we often hear have actually funded people from particular countries we we don't really have the data ourselves for that in fact virtually anyone who comes from the continent will be fully funded and it's all a matter of of funded places but of these 30 we worry that we may not be able to get all of them so how have we responded to it um, you know, we now have to have really early deadlines to even get a chance to get the visas approved. And because of the, de the, the backlogs, it's even getting harder. But one thing we hopefully is helpful into being constructive is that uh, just before COVID, we started doing this and we'll do this in a few weeks again. We have pre-conferences on the continent. We basically go to Africa. So we were in Ethiopia in 2019 with the 30 papers that were accepted, and we fly faculty paper people over to give feedback to these papers. So in some sense, they get relatively speaking far more attention than they normally even would get at the conference where there's hundreds of papers being presented. And so we spent, and we're actually going to do that in Accra at the end of this month. In fact, we'll have a session, I think, um, with KY's asset as well, where we'll bring these people. So these are the scholars from across the continent, bring them there. They have their papers pre-selected. Some of them are not perfect. We're going to help them to improve their presentations. We're going to help them to actually stand a better chance to get better feedback because that's another part of it. If they come with little experience presenting to this kind of international audiences, 
they don't get as much return from it. So we're going to, I think, seven faculty people, uh, staff will be in, in Accra, in Ghana, to actually do this end of November. And then, um, and, and we see these other people doing it as well. You know, uh, I, I know that the World Bank, you know, they now had to postpone it and probably cancel it. They had, they were meant to have in a, actually today, in fact, in Burkina Faso, an African economics conference, I think they canceled it with the coup. I know there is plans in South Africa. I think it's a pret event in South Africa. We're focusing on mid African scholars and so on. I think we're beginning to get it and we'll need to do it. We need to be in the, on the continent. The Econometric Society was already mentioned. They've elected recently for the first time a fellow from the African continent based in Africa. So it's actually really, um, I mentioned his name because he was a CSE person for many years as well. And so we're getting the beginning of, 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 of a bit more. So we need to go out and look on the continent. At the same time, quality is an issue. We are trying various ways to do it, increasing getting to people to have scholarship. We each year now have three, two or three visiting fellows funded by the, the profits from the Journal of African Economies. We're trying to get in the journal also to get more people, opportunity from Africa to get published and so on. It's just hard because all the problems we have, you know, you can't uh, solve it as, as one institution. But um, I would actually just finish in saying, just keep on putting the pressure. And I think the pressure that we do this and the fact that you write these papers is really helpful. Years ago, Tish Nudas wrote a paper in terms of of uh, the, 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 the representation from, from uh, developing countries as simply as in a topic of analysis in the top five journals. You know, we just need to keep on doing this. I know for a fact when I was chief economist, it encouraged us to set incentives differently. Think of the International Growth Center. They were strongly set incentives to have presence on the ground, to have local economists in, involved. And I think... We need to do that with all your research organizations as well, the JPALs, the IPAs, Brett, and so on. And just let's keep on doing it and find ways to increase the participation, not in a token way, but meanwhile, boosting the quality of the work as well with, with any means we have. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stefan. That's very useful. Um, and I will then hand over to Vakar for the second um, set of questions. Thanks to all the panelists. Thank you, uh, Ronel. I really appreciate uh, the inputs by all. And I think uh, I want to move to the solutions part of uh, the discussion. Uh, but I do see that already we have some solutions flowing in uh, where I can, I can see that uh, Professor Pandey informed about the work and how World Bank can contribute to bringing conferences to the South. Uh, uh, Stefan informed uh, about how, for example, they are trying to, uh, despite of the resource constraint, they are trying to change the rules of uh, participation, trying to make it more inclusive as much as, as it can be. And we also heard Dr. Amalco uh, explaining that still, uh, of course, the funding going to African think tanks is low and the capacities to produce uh, require help uh, uh, in the continent. So I think taking lead from the fact that you already have a set of solutions coming in, Probably, I think uh, the, the, the question that I would like to pose is that what role should institutions like PEP be playing in supporting the Southern participation in leading international economic development conferences? Of course, uh, the role could, uh, uh, could be broad, it could be specific, ranging from mentoring uh, with regards to submissions uh, that go into these conferences uh, potentially helping the authors strengthen their analysis, bring more rigor, refocusing. Uh, how can such networks help them, help the Southern researchers in accessing appropriate literature, for example? And, it, and, and even to that, going to that specific level of uh, crossing the language barrier that may prevent many to participate in the conferences uh, being hosted in the North. And we do understand that linguistic barriers uh, do come in even uh, in the online interface, uh, which to many of us seems uh, fairly easy. Uh, so, 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 so maybe uh, I'll go back to the panel and uh, maybe five minutes each on, on, on the very specific solutions 
and the message for institutions like PEP in supporting the Southern participation. Uh, let me uh, take the same uh, order uh, and I'll request Dr. Uh, Amalko to go first, please. Thank you very much. Uh, let me say that I much appreciate the, the focus on the issue of strengthening the participation of researchers helping improve the acceptance rate of their papers. Uh, and that applies particularly to economic, uh, to researchers and the like. That's critical. And the work that PEP and others are going to be doing in future is important. I also agree that having many of these conferences in Africa in particular, and bringing researchers and others may also be the way. So in case of some of the conferences that have been associated with in the past, uh, if you take the African Economic Conference, uh, if you take uh, the AERC, African Economic Research and Consortium Conferences held in Africa, I think the participating rate has been pretty good. Uh, and people come. Obviously, we don't have the same capacity sometimes, institutions as to. But the, the area, I must say, has done an excellent job over the years of encouraging research in Africa, bringing African policymakers around them, helping with the, you know, the, so it's a great organization and that they need to be supported. And I encourage you to find ways of collaborating with the AERC in particular. And their work has been very instrumental uh, in helping in particular African governance of African central banks. And I've been involved, so that model is there. And maybe you may want to look into their conference and see how you can also support them. Uh, I think my own experience, and that's why I go back to my agenda that are capacity African driven setting the agenda. And at the African Center for Economic Transformation, we have what we call the African Transformation Forum for every three years or so. And our, 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 our approach is policy oriented research that influence governments to take action. And for that type of conference, the type of papers you present, if that's the ultimate goal, and you have to bring in the researchers to her. But this Afghan transmission for every three years, we bring researchers, Afghan think tanks on specific issues, and we bring policymakers, including at the head of state level, and present the results, all with the idea of country focused. And that's one of the advantages that you can have Afghan research in particular, uh, draw these issues. We have the local knowledge, they can bring the specific policy issue to make them very relevant to what governments call. So that's something uh, we are doing in that context. Uh, also mentioned that the network and peer-to-peer -peer learning of bringing policymakers, bringing researchers together around specific issues, all with a view of preventing concrete policy recommendations to drive action, because ultimately, that's what we want to see happen for, for, for government. So those are my, my, my uh, reflections that the more you do these conferences in Africa, the more you bring in policymakers, the more you ensure that the research is very relevant to specific issues that you can get governments to think about ultimately to, to, uh, to promote economic transformation. That's what to me, uh, the key is, and that's why we need to encourage institutions across Africa, work with the AERC, work with policy institutes in particular, help with their capacity around specific issues. So when we have these conferences, their contribution ultimately will be to drive policy change and to drive uh, uh, economic transfer, what's the core of what we need to do for poverty reduction and all those things. So let me stop right here. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Amuako, and I think uh, you're right that uh, given that there is a model available, uh, that model can be refined, and of course, given that people 
uh, understand how that model has incubated over the years, that is something that we can take lead from. Um, I do see some hands going up, uh, but in the post, uh, just, just due to the paucity of time, I think we are requesting all of you to submit your questions in the chat, which of course we are uh, asking our panelists to respond and there will be some time at the end where they will be taking your Q&A. So I request all to submit their questions to the chat and I'll move to uh, Professor Pandey with the same question. Thanks very much. And I just also had a quick look at some of the questions in the chat. So let me try to incorporate them. So I think the one issue that, that someone noted is that often you get a rejection without feedback. I'd say that's quite common uh, across the board. So this is not something that is, that is you know, more for one category and another. I think from the perspective of uh, the, the the, the the organizers, and I can say that, for example, gives us the context, the NUDC, we had over 600 papers, I think there's 620 papers submitted, and we had an acceptance rate of 26%. Uh, but, you know, reading 600 papers, um, and to do that fast, um, precisely because we also have a conference where we try to have a deadline that works for students who are going to go on the job market. So that means it needs to be slightly later than we would usually do is it's it's too much to for us to ask those reviewing papers for us to also give feedback. So I think this comes back to the role that I think uh, that could play, which is prior to submission or even or, you know, um, uh, to give feedback. But I think I think the margin of asking for more feedback from conference organizers is probably going to be hard. Um, that's it. I think a couple of other things that I was thinking about as this discussion um, was going on and listening to the comments by KY is I think it's useful to distinguish between the value of conferences from a policy perspective, which of course is incredibly important. And then the value of conferences as a way of researchers to get feedback, which would help them get their papers published in journals. Unfortunately, these two uh, objectives are not as closely linked as maybe we would like them to be. Um, and so I think one thing that I think would be useful uh, for PEP to do is to really think through and get a sense from, from uh, local researchers what they value for their own career uh, objectives and also for professional, you know, professional advancement. Um, and I think that would then help uh, all of us think through solutions a little bit better because the solutions are very different if you're trying to think about uh, helping researchers get more engagement with policy audiences versus getting published. And then finally one, I think a number of the issues we talked about already, but I thought one more issue I thought um, uh, of is, how PEP uh, leadership could be reaching out early on to organizers or conferences to brainstorm with them on ways to improve participation. So for instance, just to give you an example of the NUDC, as you know, this uh, rotates every year. Uh, next year, it's going to be hosted around the same time of the year by Harvard. And so, you know, I'd be very happy if someone from PEP, for instance, was to email me to put you in touch with organizers for next year already, which gives a runway of a year to think a bit more creatively about what could be done uh, to enable participation. You know, should there be virtual sessions? Should there be early uh, uh, submission rates? So I think I think that would be one thing that you could do. Similarly, I think that um, the Journal of Development Economics I've seen in the past has had often had special issues which build off conferences. So again, I think one thing PEP could do is for field journals like the Journal of Development Economics you know, again, reach out to the editorial board to see their interest on maybe, you know, doing an issue on issues to do with the African economy and trying to think about what could be the way to get that. But again, I think for influencing uh, conferences, uh, I think that leadership role could really be trying to play a slightly longer term role. I think waiting till a conference is announced is probably too late to impact it in any substantive way. So I would really you know, encourage, uh, you know, discussions with all of us to identify what's on the horizon, say, in a year's time, and then uh, kind of brainstorm of what can be done there. Let me Thank you, Professor Pandey, and I think very specific uh, set of advice 
uh, from your side and uh, equally appreciate uh, the thought that one has to balance whether the support to Southern researchers has to be for getting them published or to getting their work visible or getting more engagement for them with the policymakers. So thank you. And uh, let me now move to Stefan. Yes, I, thank you. you know, um, I think it would be totally boring if we totally agreed with everything we said, which, which, which you all said. And just to, I want to constructively take issue with something KY said, not because I think he was fundamentally wrong, but there's something over the years that I've definitely experienced with working with young African researchers, is that they find it very hard to ever do research when based in Africa for the sake of advancing knowledge. It has to be about policy. I've been on the funder side and we've tortured everybody always saying it has to have impact, it has to have implications. When sitting in a Northern university, you don't have these pressures. You can do research for the sake of research and you don't all the time have to do this. And so I would appeal for, and this is where I see actually, this is where we ourselves see our conference as well. We do not ask for submissions to have any policy relevance. In fact, we explicitly don't ask for that. Um, we basically say, look, it needs to be a good research paper that potentially can be published. Now, it's not saying, of course, if you have been working so much in the policy space, that relevance of, of research for policy is important. But I think there is an important part of creating enough space for African researchers that they don't have to all the time being directly relevant. And I think that's, that is a problem. It is a problem that a lot of young scholars have because what we see in practice, and I think historically that's how I understand AARC and other kinds of institutions emerging, is to create a space for research. So that doesn't have to be embassy or aid agency funded policy research. And so that basically it's not a consultancy contract, which is basically what too much time of researchers in African research universities end up having to do. Another consultancy contract for an NGO to ask a question that can't be answered, but somehow they want to have an answer. And so you get that kind of thing. So, so I think we need to have, and I think ARC and PEP have played a big role in it. And, and apologies, Kevin, I hope you have a way of replying to this, but it's it's to actually make sure we have the space for that as well, okay? To actually have good quality research and doing this. The, the related point, that's my final point then, is where organizations like PEP and ARC are quite interesting. And I, I do appreciate that KY mentioned ARC when we are here at the PEP event. When I was chief economist in DFIT, you know, as a funder, and I know it's always a problem, people are asking, are they any different? And then you all have to try to be very different. No, actually, fundamentally, you want to just promote really good research among Southern researchers. So you get forced to be much more different than you actually should be forced to be. That's not a question, again, that's asked for Northern researchers when they replied, apply for a research funding. Whether, oh, how are you different from the other organizations that are doing? So the funders love to distinguish. I think it's quite time to try to actually thinking much more, how do we complement each other? Okay, for a while we've done that with ARC or CSAE. So the center in Oxford, we work with ARC to ask them to, to, to encourage ARC researchers to put in for the conference as well and to do the things as well. You know, it can all be done better, you know, and basically to have some form of integration Bit what Rohini was implying, you know, give early warning. You know, we definitely as CSE would welcome having people that basically says, well, you know, we were going to try to get these papers to be submitted. You know, of course, what we don't like to do is say, oh, we need to have then a PEP session, an ARC session, another session, and whatever, because then it turns always a little bit like endless branding stuff, but actually just try to find a way of treating everybody else. And it's more an appeal in general between think tanks, universities, all these different initiatives, see it as stepping stones. We see our conference as, again, as I said, it's a bit different from, say, submitting to a bread conference. Our minimum level of it for acceptance is lower. We, we see ourselves as a stepping stone for people, papers to get some shape. Maybe they can later on get to, a, to better journals and so on. So we should just find a way of working better together and integrate all these things. Thank you, uh, Stefan. And I think uh, 
you were very right. It will be very boring if we all agree to everything, but the point well taken. Uh, I think uh, this is something which uh, uh, had to be said. I do see that uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Amuako wants to come in here, but uh, with this, uh, I think we, we may have a few minutes also for my co-moderator, Ronal, to pose some questions. But Ronal, with your permission, we could go to, uh, 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 we could take a risk, quick response from Dr. Mwaku and then come to you. Okay. Yeah, I'll be very, very brief. I just wanted to react with, uh, to what Stefan said. And I said, I agree with everything he said. I have no problem. The focus, if the focus is on the career of researchers, in Africa to make sure that they can sort of advance in their career professionally and also contribute. That's great. And everything that uh, the CAAC and others do in collaboration with, uh, with you, Pep, to ensure that in these conferences and what we say AERC is wonderful, that goal. But look, everybody, my experience in Africa over the years, is how do you get policy? We do all this research. And if it's not policy relevant, it cannot influence what governments do. So how do we make sure that the connection is there? And all the things I've done when I was the EC and all that was basically and at the African Center for it, to ensure that. So those two things go together. And I've had policymakers who tell me, oh, we don't have to read all these papers. But you tell us <laughs> what we need. To. So if the goal of overall research in Africa in particular is to for, inform policy and get action, then we need to see that that, that they are the focus of mm -hmm. my presentation and that the what's driving what we do at the African Center for Economic Trend. But I agree 100% with what Stefan said, and I look forward to seeing him in Accra yeah. towards the end of this month. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it's over to you, Ronald. Thanks a lot, Bakar. Um, fantastic. Uh, we we have our first bit of sort of uh, dialogue between the panelists. Unfortunately, we have only about four minutes left. I've scanned some of the forums for questions that haven't been answered by the panelists. I think the I only found two. The one is about the the low interest of government in uh, African governments in research, which I thought was quite an interesting one. And then um, the, um, the audience member also talked about the lack of collaboration amongst the African researchers. Um, I mean, maybe one minute from each of the panelists on this. Um, the, the, maybe I should add the other um, point that was also raised in the questions answers, because I think these would probably be the last um, round of questions that we can have was just to talk about the common factors that lead to the rejection of Southern uh, participants at conferences. But I think that's quite a difficult one. So uh, if any of the panelists have uh, the appetite to dive into that, you're welcome to add that to your answer. Uh, thanks. And we'll do it in the same order as before. Well, thank you very much. I, I don't have much to add. And the question, the first low interest of African policy governments and research? That's a good question. And that's something that I've been battling all in all my career. And that's what I was talking about, policy relevant research. And I've had ministers tell me, yeah, all these research papers, we don't have time to read them, what's all this? And even the local uh, think tanks have problems there. So the question then becomes, how do we ensure that each conference, you ensure that the questions being asked, can re-inform policy and becomes policy real and get that across. So how you transit from ordinary research to policy-oriented recommendations is something that we should do to get the interest of governments and research in particular. I think that would be my answer to the question. So let me stop right here. So I can just jump in maybe on the second question, uh, which is the one of, you know, what leads to rejection. So I would very much hope, and I think as you get more data, and certainly from the NUDC, we can look at that, is that 
There is nothing particular to a region that makes uh, papers get rejected more from that region. Um, so, you know, just in terms of overall, uh, I think the evidence we have from, certainly from a lot of journal submission uh, data is that um, introductions and abstracts matter. And I think being able to, uh, you know, make it clear what the question of the paper is, how it's answered, and why that's in, why that's a uh, contribution to the literature early on in the introduction, I think is valuable because most people, I would say, reviewing um, papers for conferences are dealing with a lot of papers and unfortunately may therefore be somewhat superficial in their reading. Um, so I think so I, th I, th I think I would I would I would say that those are just kind of just off the cuff, but I certainly very much hope that there is nothing systematic in our rejections from one region rather than another. Over to Stefan. Right. Yeah. No. Just not not to add uh, too much, but but maybe also on that point, we we try almost to do blind uh, blind look at it and uh, if anything we given that we are center studying africa we always try to get maximum number from 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 the african continent accepted and for us it's you know finding a way to be constructive about that minimal level and a little bit of positive discrimination we do it's it's that other point that that, that, that was made as well and Rory immense as well you know if we get seven eight hundred applications to be reviewed in in about three weeks by a relatively small group of people. We can't really send feedback and the whole thing. We have the same with sometimes with journals that just so hard to get referee reports with the Journal of African Economies these days. So it's just very hard to do this better. But um, yeah, so we, we just hope that these other ways of doing it, going into the continent and meeting up with them and having pre-conferences and other events that will, will help to get just a better way of, of, of engaging and feedbacking. Uh, to all the people involved. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Really appreciate this advice. Uh, I think it's 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 uh, been a great uh, session in terms of not only uh, the suggestions in general on this topic, but also uh, the homework cut out for networks like PEP. So let me start by thanking uh, the three panelists, uh, Dr. Amuako, uh, uh, Stefan. Uh, Professor Rohini Pandey, and uh, of course, uh, my co-moderator, Professor Ronel. And uh, I think uh, it would not have been possible without, of course, the inputs we received from other research fellows of uh, uh, PEP, uh, including the senior leadership, uh, scientific advisor, and the executive director. I also wanted to thank in the end, uh, PEP's uh, comms team, Marjorie and uh, Chantel have been uh, very pivotal in designing this. Uh, we invite you to keep looking at uh, PEP's social media pages for the next webinar series updates, and we look forward to continued engagement in this space. So once again, thank you to everyone, and the transcript will be available for those who may like to refer it uh, later on or pass it on to your organizations. Thank you. <laughs>